Hello, everyone, and welcome back to another Thursday session covering the DNAD Awards with our last live covering the different creative pencil categories with DNAD's jury members. So hello to everyone tuning in. Um, as usual, you can ask your questions in the chat um, here on Behance. So if you're watching on YouTube, join along. Uh, we'll be on Behance keeping track of those um, and passing them on to our guests today. Um, we still have plenty to come with monthly insight sessions uh, from now. So we're not gonna be here every Thursday, but just monthly. Um, so stay tuned for our program here on Behance. We'll share a link uh, to all the other content going around DNAD. Um, in the chat. So, you know, we have this partnership going with Adobe still for the next month. Um, so yeah, you can catch up on all the content sessions we've been having um, and see what's happening as part of our partnership. But to really top the past weeks that we've had, we've had some really great guests on here. I'm really delighted to be joined by multi-winning director, Kim Moses, who's based in the US and actually joining us very early um, <laughs> and has an amazing international background. So I'm plenty of adventures and story to tell. How are you, Kia? I'm good, good morning. Um, yes, it's 5 a.m. here <laughs> where I am in Florida. I'm actually based in Jamaica. Um, but I definitely go back and forth between the U.S. and Jamaica, and I'm good. I'm awake, so that's awake. great. <laughs> and you're actually pregnant as well, what we're saying, so you're not drinking yes. any coffee at this time. Um, no, but I set five alarms because I was determined. I was like, I have to wake up. Got to party, <laughs> you know, for Adobe Live. <laughs> I appreciate it, and I hope everyone I in the audience is appreciating alarms. this as well. I'm it's sure they do. Um, it's just great to have you here, and uh, we'll keep it, you know, nice and casual and smooth, um, and a great start into your day, hopefully. As well, um, but I really can't, can't wait to speak to you and get to know you a little bit. You already mentioned Jamaica and the U.S., and I know you spent some time in the U.K. as well. Um, so we talked a little bit about your roots and your path, but I think it would be great to, yeah, kickstart with a little bit of introduction about yourself before we talk about the category that you uh, represent um, and your uh, jury member uh, part of. Um, so yeah, tell us a bit about you, um, what you do, and we'll take it from there. No problem. So yes, after 11 years in advertising um, between the US, the UK, and then Jamaica where I grew up and where I've now returned home to, um, I recently transitioned into the film industry as well as a screenwriter and director. And I did my first short film, Flight. It's a Jamaican short film. And that was an amazing experience. And I'm so proud to see that, you know, it's it ended up winning over 17 awards internationally and is now on HBO, on HBO Go. And now, um, so I was really excited about that. And I've been doing music videos and ads and so forth ever since that. Before I was always on the writing side. And I remember even just looking at making that journey from advertising to film, you know, I, I was like, okay, you know, with, um, with an ad that's 15, 30, 60 seconds. So a short film is just, if it's 13 minutes, 13 ads streamed together. <laughs> but it was um, it was a big wake up call to see just how much, uh, you know, larger the film world was and just learning all the elements and kind of transitioning from advertising into film. So that's been a fun journey. And then also I am the co-founder and chief creative officer of TCP, those creative people in Jamaica. We're a big ideas company with a small team ranging. Um, we do advertising, product development, anything that has creativity. We do that down to making Jamaican greeting cards. So yes, quite a, quite a range. And I'm really grateful that I've gotten to experience the US, the UK, the Caribbean audience because I love looking at how they view humor and storytelling differently and bring, being able to bring that to the DNAD panel. I already have so many questions <laughs> um, about your background and, uh, you know, also this kind of all cultural, this mixing, you know, um, kind of pot and melting pot you have with your background, which I'm sure brings so much to your creativity and the way you work. Um, and, you know, the, your journey kind of uh, from Jamaica to the US through the UK, um, what kind of drew you to film as well um, in terms of going from the advertising world to a complete, you know, still a very different industry 
Um, so what, let's start with, you know, Jamaica, because, you know, what is the creative industry like over there and how did you get drawn into advertising? Yes, uh, the creative industry in Jamaica right now, I'm so proud to see just how it's growing and evolving with this new wave of creatives um, in every category from film to music to art. You know, there's just this amazing generation right now and I'm really proud to see everything that's coming out of Jamaica. And for me, growing up in Jamaica, um, you know, when it came, I was born in the US, but I grew up in Jamaica and uh, my mother is British. That's the reason for all the differences. Uh -huh. Nice, and, uh, I didn't know this. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. No, and, um, yeah, you know, so when it came time to go to college, I literally met with an advisor and I asked what combines visuals and words? And then she told me, oh, that's advertising. I said, okay, well, I'll do that. And then I applied to School of Visual Arts in New York and got in there. And the same thing that drew me to advertising drew me to film again, you know, with the combination of visuals and writing, because that was always my passion growing up as an only child in Jamaica and having this vivid imagination. So I'm so grateful that, you know, I had the opportunity to be able to hop from country to country. And then after completing my, um, bachelor's degree in advertising at school of visual arts i moved to the uk thanks to my mom <laughs> and there i worked at mccann erickson as a creative for several years i was there for four years and then i moved back home because i just i always have this pull to go back home you know that's where my heart is and i wanted to be a part of bringing the creative industry forward in jamaica taking all that I've learned, you know, a lot of people were like, why are you moving back? You know, but that's because it's such an amazing place that produces so much creativity, it oozes creativity. Um, and I want to go back and be a part of the people there who are being creative right now. And how, um, how did you make this jump to the film industry? Um, was that, uh, you know, quite a risky um, kind of transition for you? Um, I know you Said, you know obviously the visual and the words were things that drew you that were kind of an overlap between the two but how did you transition and for anyone who's might be watching as well and interested to you know shift their career and um, it is quite a bold move sometimes to jump from the ad agency which is already a very intense and competitive world yes it was um you know it was always something that i had just underlined beneath the surface i'm always looking at ways to push myself and i knew I wanted to explore the longer format storytelling. And of course, the perfection is in me. You know, I was originally, you know, waiting till, okay, I'm going to have to enroll in film school and read all these books first. But an opportunity arose in Jamaica through Jafta Propella, um, which is a script to screen competition to help young filmmakers make short films to break into the film industry. So when I saw that opportunity pop up, I was like, okay, let me give it a shot. Um, and that I used literally, I started the project, the whole process in January of 2018. And we had to have the whole um, script, all the different versions ready by June. We shot in June. Um, I had two full days, two half days to shoot my first short film. I did 13 rewrites. I was literally learning on the go between workshops, YouTube and books. And just teaching myself a lot but it's, it's a really fun journey and i think just trying to you know not overthink it and just go for it because we're all creatives at heart once we're in advertising we're storytellers and what's amazing that i realized with advertising as well is it taught me how to tell stories in a short amount of time and that's so important for short films you know because you, you have to make people connect with the characters and take them on this journey and have the beginning, the middle and end, the conflict and resolution all in a short amount of time. So we already have it in us if we're in the advertising industry, <laughs> but it is, it is a big yeah. leap. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And I mean, this also was within you going back to Jamaica as well. And um, you, I mean, you mentioned already, but you know, those creative people is also something that is, uh, you know, running for you. And um, I'd love to hear a little bit more about what your work is based around now as well as part of TCP and what you guys are doing. 
Yes, we do a range of from corporate advertising to online content. Um, you know, we make products such as Jamaican greeting cards, which again was a, another application of my advertising <laughs> skills with copywriting and the combination of words and visuals is greeting cards. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> you know, we're proud that we're becoming almost the hallmark of Jamaica and, you know, doing that in my, in my free time is just so rewarding. Um, to be able to just come up with jokes and headlines essentially in greeting card form. And we, we create all types of novelty items and just creativity in, in any form. You know, it's myself and my two business partners, you know, and we're a small team. And we recently have, you know, two other employees that work with us and it's just really fun. And we wanted to call it those creative people so that we were always open to creativity in every form. And how have you seen the creative industry change in Jamaica since you went back and, um, you know, kind of set this up and, you know, create, connected and surrounded yourself with all these people? What's been the kind of main themes and changes that you've noticed? Well, one of the things that I love is in, in essence, moving back to what some people would call a small pond, you know, in comparison to the UK and the US is just making sure that you continue to think and dream big. And I think that's something that exists amongst many creatives in Jamaica, especially with the introduction of the internet and the world becoming so much more interconnected and us being able to tune in so much easier as a younger generation to everything that's going on in the world and also being able to put ourselves out there and reach the rest of the world so much easier from Jamaica. So I think technology has definitely helped because Jamaica's always had that creativity um, within us, you know, on a daily basis, you know, the people are so animated and hilarious. And, you know, even if you're driving and you look on the side of the road, there's just so many storytellers and so much excitement happening. So it's just buzzing with um, creative energy. And it's always been like that, but it's getting even more exciting to see what the young people are doing. That's great to hear. And I, I, as you said, I think technology has given this platform and maybe the connection to, you know, a broader audience and, and an opportunity to network. And we're seeing this right now um, with the current circumstance and, uh, you know, lockdowns and, 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 you know, having less access. And, you know, I think we're still very lucky that we're able to do those things and, and stay connected. Yes. So hopefully you're also, I know you're um, stuck in the US, but um, you're able to also keep going. And, and how's the situation, you know, been? I'm interested to also see, you know, and hear from you and we'll move into you know the dnad awards but how has the experience been for the industry uh, from your perspective with the past couple of months and um you know obviously also in the next year that's coming up yeah it's been a really interesting time and i think that you know for so many of us who have been just running on autopilot for so long it's definitely a big moment to pause you know, my heart has definitely been so heavy with everything going on in the world from COVID, you know, to the protests, you know, to just everything that's happening this year, you know, as a black female creative, you know, mother to be, you know, it's, it's, it's been really heavy this year for me personally. And I think the creative industry, um, I know that for each of us, it's a, it's a different experience, you know, for some of us, it's, harder for some of us it's been an opportunity to pause and reflect um some of us to re-energize um you know look at our priorities uh create i think that a lot of creators who have less going on right now are able to really incubate and um work on those whether it's a passion project or you know something that you know they've been wanting to do for a while and they finally have the time to do it reconnecting with family remembering what's important it's just it's interesting how it affects us in in so many ways but i'm really proud to see how the world has been coming together um especially in protest for the things that are really important because at the end of the day you know we're all human and i remember back in the day i had seen this ad from united colors of benetton um where they had the heart organ just all these different hearts you know and they looked exactly the same biologically the same gross looking bleeding red hearts and they made the point that you can't tell what race um any of those hearts are when you just look at the organs you know and i really think um for us in advertising and the creative industry it's 
how can we help to move the world forward, you know, coming out of a pandemic, coming out of a sad situation to show that racism is very much still alive. How can we be a part of um, changing the world and helping it to go where it should have been years and centuries ago? Yeah, yeah, we're nursing a lot of these conversations that, and, you know, Benetton, for example, I'm not sure when this ad was, but, you know, it feels that it keeps on returning and it's just about, you know, talking of maybe, you know, raising and talking about it in a new way and, and keep going and moving it forward, like you said. And I think some of the work that you selected today as well, you know, the Sandy Hook video is also an example of how, you know, we're touching on these, these topics and, and they're still relevant and still, you know, requiring attention and effort and creative input. So, um, I completely agree. I also wanted to talk a little bit more about direction and how you, you got involved into this category and, and the process, because I know you also, um, you know, were part of your very first film flight. And I really wanted to ask you a couple of questions about this before we move on to the work and just to wrap up the, your little introduction as well that we've um, also kind of kept on <laughs> going for the past 15 minutes, surprisingly <laughs> enough. Um, but it's so interesting to hear. So um, I wanted to hear about, yeah, first flight, um, uh, first flight, flight, <laughs> but your first film flight. Um, and there is also something that I don't know, uh, you know, kind of raised um, and came up in my mind when you're talking about moving forward, because this is about dreaming. Um, and the, the film is a, is a story that explores dreams bigger than us. Um, and, you know, I was interested to hear what made you choose the story and um, the kind of meaning behind the film's narrative as well. So tell us a little bit more about this process. Sure, um, yes, with Flight, um, there's this idea that I had um, in the storytelling of Jamaica being this little island of big dreamers. And, you know, that's how we've always been. That's why we achieve so much of the things that we do because, you know, we don't make size intimidate us. And so from there, the natural thought process was what was one of the biggest dreams a character could have, which is going to the moon and who would be one of the littlest or littlest, as we like to say, characters that could have that. And so, you know, I thought of this character of this little boy from an inner city community in Kingston, Jamaica, who feels that he's even further and further away from the moon, you know, and I wanted to explore the relationship between father and son, um, really using it as an opportunity to spark change in terms of showing how things should be, um, you know, with uh, fathers, um, whether they're single fathers or, you know, a part of a relationship, getting more involved with their kids, the community getting more involved. And I thought it was really important as a female screenwriter and director to also use a platform to uplift our youth, um, especially the underprivileged, the races that you don't get to see as much on the screen that don't get to see themselves, and also to uplift Black men and um, show them everything that they can be as fathers. And so, yeah, it was an amazing opportunity to just tell one of those stories. And you're also underplaying it because I know you received multiple awards for this and it, it received, you know, attention as well globally. So um, it's, you know, it's great to have you talk a little bit about this. And how was it to step foot into the Jamaican film industry as you were starting and, um, you know, got involved in this? I know you had a very small budget, um, also a female crew. We were just talking about diversity and um, these were all elements that were part of your process. Um, yeah. It was amazing to be welcomed into the film industry and um, into, you know, the Jafta Propeller community. And it was really encouraging. You know, they just want to push the creatives um, back out into the world to share the stories. And it's so collaborative and, and positive there in Jamaica. So many talented filmmakers. The crew and cast were amazing. Um, it was a very diverse group, um, a, all Jamaican, Caribbean um, vibe, a, a good mix of male and female. It was written, co-directed, produced, and shot by Black women. So that was amazing. And we got to work along with just so many talented men. The kids had never acted before. So that was interesting. And they were all from inner city communities. So. It was just such a positive experience. Well, we'll just have to show it. We have just the quick trailer that we have there. So I think we should um, just let it speak for itself. And then we'll move on to the category as, as well, you know, and, and direction as part of the awards. So let's show it right now and uh, we'll catch up just after.
What is it with you and the moon? Eh? Come in, Kingston. Kingston, this is Mars. How far is the moon again? Just 384,400 kilometers. Just enough kilometer that. We're all good. Great. Um, so yeah, great, you know, seeing a little snippet of that. I hope everyone's enjoying. Um, and we had, well, uh, you know, we were showing this, I had to catch up a little bit on the chat and who's joining. We have Darina. And we also have a Sean, good morning, Sean, who joined us. And we also have someone, a viewer, who's joining us from Montevideo, and it's 6 a.m., uh, maybe 6.20 now. So appreciate the early rising <laughs> time. Um, it seems that we're all early birds here. So uh, good morning, everyone who's joining us. And um, we also have a little message. Congratulations on the baby, Kia. Um, so definitely a nice encouragement um, and great crowd joining us. So please ask questions for Kia. Um, as we move into the category. So great seeing the trailer and we can also put it in the chat if anyone wants to find out a little bit more about flight. Um, let's move on as well to the category and how you got involved uh, to judging as part of DNA the awards. Um, you know, how is the process for you? Um, how did you find it as well? You know, obviously being home um, and yeah, being part of the direction category and seeing all this work. Uh, it was, it's been such a wonderful experience. DNAD has been amazing. And going from someone who was in the UK working and dreaming one day of, you know, winning a DNAD, it was just so amazing to be approached by them when I had returned to Jamaica, um, you know, because you think, oh, I'm so far away now, you know, sometimes that does cross your mind. And so, you know, the day that I received the invitation from them in my inbox to judge, you know, I, it was such an honor um, to represent Jamaica and to represent, you know, um, a diverse group uh, in the judging. You know, I noticed that the Jamaica flag is not there as yet in the awards in terms of countries that have won in the DNAD. So I see that as a personal challenge now that I'm back home. And yeah, it was just amazing to be in the direction category. The judges were so amazing. Uh, there were six of us. The range was amazing in terms of diversity. I was really happy to see that. Um, you know, it ranged from judges who, you know, have Brazilian, Australian, UK, American, Israeli, Jamaican backgrounds, you know, spanning countries from Singapore to Germany. And it was just so amazing to see that diversity, the balance between male and female, which was almost even, the range of ages and years of experience. So I was really happy to see how DNAD had selected the panel and everyone was so positive, but coming with these different opinions and backgrounds and styles. And I really love how that brought diversity in a very natural way to the conversation and to the people who are, who are having the conversation around the work. And I was really happy to be a part of that because we came together um, for a great friendly debate over great work from around the world. And it was amazing because at the end of the day, we just chose the work that was the best, regardless of who or where it came from. Um, but I was so happy with the experience. It's brilliant to hear because everyone who's come on the Thursday slots has just been, you know, having great feedback about judging and being part of the awards and some of the right. conversations that he has brought. And, you know, I love that you're speaking about diversity as well, because it's something that every jury member has mentioned as well um, and has been part of the process and something that they were bearing in mind. Um, so, you know, I think it's great that we can see everyone connection come together uh, through this initiative as well. Um, and I know you also mentioned, you know, judging the best work and, and then rewarding this. Um, what is the best work in the direction category? What are the criteria that you're looking at? Um, and what does it mean? Which might be hard to define, but I'm, I'm testing you now that we're <laughs> um, a little bit more. No, I learned so much through this DNAD process and I love seeing how the judging criteria works, you know, because we were encouraged to consider four key questions in the order of importance. Is it 
brilliantly crafted. You know, does the use of the craft elevate the idea? Is the idea inspiring and does it fit the purpose? So we're looking at craft, we're looking at elevation, inspiration and purpose. And what I love about that is um, it's so inspiring as creatives to also take on those four key questions when we're when we're doing any piece of work and to kind of use that as a litmus test and, um, you know, a way to kind of have these check boxes to see, you know, are we delivering according to the DNA D standard? So I think that's something we can also all walk away with and keep in mind. And I love the fact that it's this challenge to create um, true creative excellence. Um, and I love the, the one that stood out the most to me in terms of what we were looking for, especially in the direction category, is does it elevate the idea? Because when a director is given the script, um, does what they do take it so far beyond the script to a place that the script couldn't have gone on its own, or do they just simply bring the script to life? And so we were really looking for directors that elevated the idea to a place that no one could have imagined starting out where it's so much more, you know, than could have been seen and, and just how they did that. And then in terms of looking at the various pencils again and learning about that through the process, um, you know, with just the work that is worthy of merit being in the shortlisting um, part of it. And then you have the best work of the year worthy of being in the annual for the wooden pencil, that standout work that's beautifully executed with an original and inspiring idea at its core. I feel like I work at DNA, mm. you know, yeah. for the graphite <laughs> pencil. Brilliant. <laughs> An outstanding, <laughs> iconic work that achieves true yeah. creative excellence, which we're discussing today for the yellow. And then, of course, the coveted black pencil, which unfortunately there weren't any of this year. But that work that is groundbreaking um, is reserved for the black pencil. And I found that really interesting because I think that the more that we as creatives are all tuned into the same sources of inspiration, I think it's getting harder and harder to break ground, you know? And so we have to look at how to push ourselves to a place of groundbreaking work each year and maybe how to tune out a bit about what everybody else is tuning into and really find it within ourselves the way that the geniuses did back in the day <laughs> when they didn't have TV and the internet um, to truly push ourselves to keep breaking ground. But yeah, so that's part of the, the way that the whole judging process has gone. And I think, again, it's nice to think about, you know, while we're working as creatives, what pencil would this win, <laughs> you know, um, as we work? It's just, it's really inspiring as a judge. And, you know, for anyone kind of looking at how DNA D looks at creative excellence and achieving it to bring that into your everyday. It's brilliant. And I think a really good overview as well of what, you know, the different pencils are for the audience and as a little reminder of how the work is awarded. Um, and yeah, the black pencil is a really interesting conversation because we're talking about innovation and that's, uh, you know, a term that's been coming up quite frequently in the conversations we've been having in these sessions. Um, and what makes a black pencil is is really um, a debate and but also something that you bring in those conversations and uh, that you have with the jury, I'm sure. Um, but, you know, how much of it is, I know you're talking about some topics as well that come from your background. You're talking about storytelling. So, you know, <laughs> what is creative excellence in terms of storytelling? And I'm, I'm sure we'll talk about some examples that you have. Um, but I, you selected a really good kind of overview of these different pencils. I'm really glad you ran through them. <laughs> um, so the different examples you've had, and I'd, I'd love to, you know, go straight into it because I have a soft spot for uh, the Apple uh, selection that you made in terms yeah. of work selected. Um, and I think it's just such a great, you know, uh, upbeat, positive way to kickstart uh, the work that you uh, we're going to talk about today. Um, and so Apple, um, and, you know, I think there's been a conversation and this brings me to this about the brands that have been brought uh, forward in these awards and whether, you know, there's this kind of um, debate between whether you want to support one of those brands that, you know, are seen as giants and maybe more commercial and whether that's authentic and genuine and what the messaging behind it is. Um, so how is it for you and your perspective to, you know, compare the work, for example, of Sandy Hook or Apple or even Ikea that we'll talk about later and seeing whether this narrative and story is genuine and authentic 
uh, from from your side? Yeah, it's really interesting uh, because I love underdogs. It's ironic that the other yellow pencil was an Apple piece called Underdogs. Um, you know, and and in terms of looking at the range of brands, you know, it's really interesting that a brand like Apple, as big as it is, is able to keep um, its finger on the pulse and and create these really creative stories um, that are either down to earth or real or make us feel good in ways that feel authentic. And I think that's just such an amazing achievement to almost remain small while being so big, you know, and again, for us, it was looking at the story itself. And then, you know, when, and of course, you know, does it fit the purpose, um, in which case for all of these major brands, it does, but it's the way that they, they tell those stories in a way that feels so authentic or unexpected or surprising, you know, and to your question earlier, when you asked me, um, how the current, uh, climate, um, affects you know the creative work you know we were actually debating amongst the judges you know what kind of reflects the world right now in terms of what um pencils are given out as well you know what kind of represents where we were at and you know of course we've been bombarded by all of these covid ads you know which have been you know overly emotional and trying to make us cry and brands saying something telling us what to feel but then what is powerful about an ad like Apple AirPods Bounce is it actually embodies the freedom that we're all craving right now, you know? And for me, like it's those pieces that embody um, what it is that we're craving as an audience or, you know, help us to laugh when we're feeling sad, help us to escape. And with this piece, um, the first piece that I want us to look at, the Apple AirPods Bounce, it's amazing how it encapsulates freedom, being able to go outside <laughs> and bounce yeah. around. We can't wait yeah. for that day. Um, we won't all have trampolines, but you know, um, it's amazing how, you know, when you think of the depiction of the future, you might think of it being this super futuristic, edgy portrayal. And right now a, a positive depiction of the future is just a simple level of freedom. Um, and so in terms of us looking at also just how it encapsulates um, so much while also checking all the boxes mentioned earlier of the criteria. Um, yeah, you know, it's amazing that these pieces were able to do that. And I wanted us to look at one yellow, one graphite and one wooden to kind of just look at the range. Um, but the storytelling across the three is quite different. Two of which make you smile, make you laugh. And one of which just stops you in your tracks. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, we'll show the video just now, but uh, just before that, I really like that you're talking about um, a topic we haven't really mentioned before, which is imagination. So the viewers, um, you know, the, the ability for the story to elevate some emotion, but also tap into imagination and freedom, as you said right now, and this kind of weightlessness that the, you know, ad goes through is something that's really magical. So let's show the video now and we'll catch up right after. <laughs> I just learned some jazz today, it's true. He just learned some jazz today, and you, you gon' learn, you gon' learn. It was just past one, went to three men from four or five step to the door, like, oh my gosh, just throw that cash in a back bag, run around the back and pull up the track, cause yo, couldn't believe them stories can see for no reason. Please just go and leave them fake, is in season, but I not pre them, cause nowadays. You couldn't find me like when them CCTV, then them see them can't go grab me. Better them try to go and see. Taking the heights like Andes, Andes man one step to me. Couldn't get the best of me, couldn't be the rest of me. Check from me, touch the brakes and go slow. Oh no, dust them out with the one quick solo. Boom.
You gon' learn, you gon' learn this just today, yes. All right, so what a way to start the day. I feel like I could watch this forever. And just also the music and, um, you know, the whole production of it um, is amazing. And I actually, first question for me is, you know, how much is production a part of what you, you know, also integrate within all of this? I know the storytelling and the narrative is important to you, but I was just reading up on, um, you know, how all of this was created and all the physical bouncing was done in camera with different props. And then the city was, kind of set was built in an in airport hangar so um there is so much that goes behind this and the entire production was just shot in, in 12 days I think um so a huge huge uh, you know amount of work with all these submissions but you know how much do you bear this in mind as well in elevating the story how much is too much and also is sometimes simplicity um the way to go Yes, um, you know, a big part of what we looked for the way the direction uh, category, as you know, we spoke about earlier, is how it how does a director elevate the idea? And what's amazing is to think about the director as being a conductor of this beautiful orchestra of visuals and audio and all these moving parts. And that's something that we really looked at. How did they handle all the various moving parts? Because when you look at it, it's like, okay, you know, um, as a director, okay, you know, we're going to make this black and white, you know, um, the casting, choosing the perfect guy to be bouncing around, um, you know, we're going to have him change into a suit. It's going to have that vintage vibe meets the modern world, you know, all these different things that the director had to look at. The set design, as you said, I love seeing the behind the scenes uh, video of how they created it, that story behind the story of, of the creative process. And instead of choosing for it to be all CG, you know, to have the trampoline be in camera the way that they did and combining with the, the special effects, um, you know, to have the choice of music, which is huge. Um, in this case, the track, um, which in speaking to that as well, just to sidetrack a bit to diversity, I love when diversity is, it happens in this seamless, beautiful dance and it's not forced, you know, um, where you have this black and white classic vintage style and then you have this Caribbean urban twist on jazz as the sound and it's those fusion of cultures and elements and genres and you know, expanding on across time. Like I love when diversity is handled in that way. So beautifully and effortlessly in this dance of fusion and unexpected fusion. And he would have had to look at performance, you know, it being a combination of walking, dancing, bouncing, the little details that's so big for a director. How did they handle all the different details, people's reactions, all the little tiny breadcrumbs scattered across the storytelling, the lighting, the, you know, everything. It just hitting all the beats in the song, in the editing, you know, it's how a director handles all those moving pieces to complete perfection that elevates the idea worthy of a pencil. So it's amazing to look at that and to just look at how the director handled it and how the set design was done and how everything all the little pieces were perfect and funny enough this was a piece that i think this was possibly one of the only pieces if not the only one that didn't go up for debate <laughs> with the judges on the I panel i was about to ask <laughs> yeah, it was, this one was just a given word. we weren't even talking about it because we're like that's all we know everybody knows Done. that okay. <laughs> our it's just amazing um so i love that um it was hands down one of our favorites of course this one of the winners of the yellow pencil. I love that you picked this one because I agree and, and you gave such a great description of the work and it's such an elegant celebration of um, you know freedom, as you said. Um, and something that you mentioned, obviously, is the production that went behind this. And Apple obviously has the means to do this and is able to create that. And they're also under pressure. We talked about giants and those big corporate brands are able to still create something that's this special. Um, but you know we if we go back to some things that you mentioned like flight sometimes a smaller budget can also elevate creativity and allow you to perhaps um you know create and and elevate stories in a different way um yeah. do you think that's also um going to be you know part of 
um, maybe the next years as well. And now that we're seeing some changes in industry and we're maybe home, um, there's going to be a little bit more of a makeshift approach to creating yeah. advertising. I've always been a fan of low tech, hands on, uh, even in flight, we couldn't afford a big uh, budget to make the space scenes. And so we had to shoot on black overlay. We used cardboard boxes for spaceships so you know i love the creativity that comes out of challenges and i think that you know that's something for us to look forward into this next season as we come out of this as budgets do get smaller how can we be creative and you know for a brand like apple even when the budget is big how can we do it for real uh because there is this this beauty this authenticity that happens when you know you find a way to do something for real and capture that in camera um of course cg is amazing and i love it as well but there's just this powerful place for real and i think that that's something that is also going to be a trend moving forward is this return to real and authenticity um in the storytelling but with yeah. imagination and escaping <laughs> a part of it as well it's a really difficult balance just you know kind of strike because i like that you're talking about real and we've been talking about authenticity for so long now but sometimes it's just so hard to describe that you only you know know it, it is real when you see it and it might be something that you can't really quite pinpoint and so easily um but i think the topic of real brings us to your second selection which is the sandy hook uh, submission and yeah. it's the back to school essentials. Um, and I think this is another uh, angle on real um, and the Very way good. it's been done in such a you know fantastic uh, way and powerful way. Um, so tell us a little bit more about um, this submission. Yes, with this submission, well, I don't, do you want us to watch it first and then? Up to you. Let's just watch it first yeah. and then we'll and give, then we'll we'll give context. <laughs> This year, my mom got me the perfect bag for back to school. These colorful binders help me stay organized. These headphones are just what I need for studying. These new sneakers are just what I need for the new year. This jacket is a real must have. My parents got me the skateboard I wanted. It's pretty cool. These scissors really come in handy in art class. These colored pencils, too. These new socks, they can be a real lifesaver. <laughs> I finally got my own phone to stay in touch with my mom. back um and yeah I, I guess you know just a little bit of context on um why you selected the work and we did mention it uh with sarah a few a few weeks back and i read a little bit more um about it since we spoke about the you know the submission and um i was you know we talked a little bit about imagination in the first submission and here we're perhaps talking a little bit more about action as well that's required from the viewer and it's quite an interesting piece when we're looking at it from a viewer's perspective and not just um, from a kind of production uh, perspective as well. So tell us about, you know, your experience judging this piece. This was one of my favorite pieces because I think that it's getting harder and harder to outsmart the audience. Um, to get them to not see the twist coming. And I think that was such a big responsibility on the director um, to not make a seat coming, you know? So, it, and, and the way that it was handled so that it starts off with this genre of, you know, just the cheesy back to school ads literally has us about to change a channel because you're like, oh no, not another one of these ads. And then the real power that I loved um, in it in terms of how it was handled with direction is that it made us as the audience and ultimately the panel you feel what the characters are feeling as it's unfolding and that's so hard to achieve you know it's not telling us what to feel it's taking on us on this journey so we're with the kids where we're in this happy place and then there's these little touches like if you notice actually when you play it back 
the from the very second frame where the girl is talking about the folders a teacher is blurred she's blurred out in the background she's frantically closing the door and there's these little breadcrumbs of subtext of what's about to happen and then you know you're going along as the audience you're experiencing the panic start to set in and the 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 wait what's happening oh my gosh wait everybody run it's a shooting um you experience that on that journey in real time and so much happens and it takes you on this journey of panic and how it feels when your world is turned upside down in a situation like that as a director to handle that the way that he did to um direct the kids to be have one foot over here um in the cheesy world and one foot over here um as the panic starts to happen so that you start to see it in their faces and their voices this tension between that genre of almost cheesy comedy and horror and being able to subtly cross that in these ways that make you feel it and feel it and feel it right up until you know the end when you have you know when you look at how he handled the performance of the children how he handles sound design you know where the music goes from cheesy to more serious to quiet to now you're hearing all of the these alarming sounds like you're there to the point that it's completely silent with the girl in the bathroom and you're hearing just the footsteps and you're holding your breath with her it's just such an amazing journey that the director was able to take us through and really elevate the idea beyond the script and to um make us feel that as an audience that is getting harder to surprise harder to make us feel and um it was just so well done Absolutely, and it's it's a truly unique way of kind of handholding uh, through experiences, and and it's truly immersive in the way you said that. And it's something that you started with um, when describing this work is that consumers are and viewers and audiences are getting brighter, as you said, they can change channel, they can ignore messages, you know, and narratives and that story piece that you're talking about. So there's really genius in being able to carry uh, viewers through experiences. Um, which is something that's done here um, really perfectly well. Um, and I was reading a little bit more about Sandy Hook's co-founder, um, uh, Nicole Hockley, I think. Um, and she really wanted, you know, the viewers to understand how they can recognize this behavior and intervene in, in, in situations of uh, violence and, and shootings. And um, this was really part of a broader Know the Sign uh, campaign um, where, you know, as an audience, you actually, um, you know, being required to notice the signs um, and obviously lead to further thinking um, as yeah. a result of watching. And for um, being able to read the signs and the signs that are there, that being a back to school essential, you know, just that, that notion and how it was really elevated. And again, how creativity can be used to make us feel something in a genuine way, you know, not like a lot of the ads right now that are telling us what to feel to spark change, you know, um, so again, looking at the difference between freedom and how we hope to feel after COVID to also something like uh, Black Lives Matter, something like school shootings, you know, how can we make people really feel something um, in the way that we direct and tell the stories to start change. And do you feel this kind of sensitivity to emotions is something that we're seeing more as a trend and theme within, uh, you know, for example, this category this year, because, you know, the way we and, you know, we as advertisers should approach emotion is getting more and more subtle and, you know, they're yeah. extremely complex. There isn't just this one, you know, obvious way, as you said, which could be end up being, you know, very, you know, miss the mark completely. There's a lot of pressure on advertising to, to fine tune their um, sensitivity to that. Yes, and to achieve that subtlety is actually so hard, you know, and yeah. that's why, you know, we, we love what directors do um, because it's, it's, it's so much work to make something look simple. And to do that in, this ad was, what, one minute? To do that in one minute, to make us feel so much and connect to these characters in one minute is just amazing. And is there something that you didn't see this year in terms of the category um, and, you know, the way it maybe, I mean, this was a truly unique way of approaching a certain, you know, discussion and narrative, but was there something that you hadn't seen or that was particularly high debate? Um, actually, this was one, this was one of the ones that was highly debated because um, yeah. you know, some of the judges, for example, couldn't see past the cheesy, you know, yeah. 
school vibe. And we're like, no, you know, uh, it's supposed to be that way, uh, you know, and, but just, yeah, I mean, there were several ones that we debated because of different, um, you know, approaches to taste and, you know, what we think visually and, you know, what level of direction was involved. For example, when CG is involved. Um, but yeah, you know, there, I was really happy with the range that I saw. I mean, me personally, I would love to see um, work from other cultures being entered more into the DNA D. I, I think that for me, that was missing is just being able to see more and more and more cultures reflected. And I think that will happen with time. And especially as DNA D continues to reach out into other countries and raise awareness in other countries, which I'm excited to see. And yeah, you're saying something really important as well, because I think some uh, certain conversations have been very much marked by culture and associated to certain, you know, parts of the world. And, and this leads on to the, the last piece that you selected, which is Christmas. And I find this always very much associated to, you know, the UK and the US way of approaching a time of the year that is very commercial um, yeah. and is also very saturated. Um, so there are certain conversations that, in the, you know, in the Sandy Hook example, we see um, haven't been touched on before, but for your last example, we're seeing something that's just overdone and completely <laughs> covered and has been covered every year. And you're always wondering around the kind of last few months of the year, what's going to be the new new thing and uh, the new trend. So what is, you know, going yeah, ahead? <laughs> it's, it's like always like, you know, I love what they said. It's always sappy and emotional and trying to make us cry. And, you know, you as the audience, you're like, I know, I know you're trying to make me cry and you're not going to make me cry. <laughs> Um, so I love what I did with entering um, the Christmas market and again, being quite disruptive. And what I loved about these three pieces that I chose to share with you guys today is how they all have this unexpected fusion. So, you know, with Apple AirPods, it was the black and white classic vintage with the modern world and the urban um, soundtrack twist on jazz, you know, again, unexpected and him just bouncing around that departure from the ordinary world to the surreal, you know, with Sandy Hook, again, starting off happy, cheesy, the, this back to school genre and having the unexpected fusion of the back to school shooting, the horror, um, you know, that happens afterwards, you don't see it coming. And it's this surprising uh, fusion and hair. Um, it's a surprising fusion of, you know, these everyday household items, you know, delicate, porcelain, proper, and they're, you know, singing with this diss track um, from the grime genre of music in Christmas, completely disruptive, unexpected um, coming from Ikea and how that was handled. It's again, this unexpected fusion. And for me, that was one of the big trends that I saw in our category this year, those unexpected fusions, mixing of genres, um storytelling that took us on that journey and that level of creativity so yeah this is a really great one and i'm happy to see how it disrupted the christmas market <laughs> let's watch it then because you gave just a really great description and i want everyone to take a look so we'll catch up with that <laughs> yeah, as usual <laughs> I must confess, this place ain't blessed. This place is a mess. Disgusting. But the but, but. no, you don't deserve no guests. No. In here, in here, I don't want to lay down or rest. Are you crazy? That crack in the wall needs addressing. The state of the floor is just depressing, man. This table's older than the pyramid. It's older? At least it's younger than the mirror is. This place is small, and it's barely a house. Never mind the cat, you couldn't even swing a mouse. It's so small. Mm. Those curtains are looking tired. Decorations are tired. Look, your style is fired. Fired. It's like somebody hit you with a bulldozer. Bang. If your house was a car, it would get pulled over. Excuse me, please. This is very, 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 very unacceptable. Silence the critics. Ikea, the wonderful everyday. Fresh and clean. 
And we're back. <laughs> um, so yeah, you, you gave a good overview. <laughs> yeah, so it is that a great one. It makes me laugh every time. And again, it's this unexpected fusion. Um, you know, I love the way, I love the soundtrack through this ad. I found out who DWE is. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I really, I just think that it's just so fun and it's interesting, um, you know, with us closing our conversation and again, looking at how, you know, it kind of reflects the time as well is that we're all stuck inside right now. And, you know, this idea of, you know, these things in the home still being full of imagination and coming to life and, and telling you something is just so interesting, again, um, to show that in this confined space telling this story um how you can really elevate the idea and you know one of the debates that we looked at on the jury is what level of direction was involved you know and again because it was a direction category it was hard because you wonder um how much did the director direct and that's something that you know you, you just want to sit with the director and find out like did you actually work out the little expressions of all the figurines because it's cg so it's it's harder to tell, you know, to what level of involvement, you know, but there's so many moving parts that, again, the director would have to look at, you know, the subtle performance uh, reactions of the couple, the, the figurines themselves. I love, love, love the lyrics of the song yeah. in terms of the storytelling and what they're saying and just those little touches like having the, um, you know, the dinosaur at the end come back out for just those last beats of the song and drop and it was just really well done, really fun. And it makes us laugh, you know, and again, to the point of, um, you know, how will this current climate um, that we're in affect creativity? Um, one of the amazing case studies that I heard about once at a workshop was, you know, with the American film, My Big Fat Greek Wedding, they were saying that one of the successes of that film was the timing of the release. The fact that when it was released, it was after 9-11, you know, when people just wanted and needed to laugh, you know, and I think there is a place where when things get heavy, um, the way that they are right now, there's always that we need things that are going to make us smile, things that are going to make us laugh, things are that, that are going to help us escape. And I think that that will definitely be one of the trends of where the creative industry and work moves to because we need it. I really like that you mentioned this again because we're going back to this imagination and just um, a very good understanding of what viewers need. Um, and that hits the spot with um, the work that you selected today. Um, and yeah, this was actually submitted um, by Mother, um, so the creative agency Mother. And um, I was reading a little bit more about, um, you know, what they were trying to achieve. And um, again, that goes back to disruption. This is exactly what they were uh, mentioning, which is, you know, seeing, finding things that people weren't necessarily used to seeing come to life um, mm -hmm. and that would make the most surprising kind of pairing. Um, and the challenge was actually the music as well, I read. So something that you mentioned in terms of making that work uh, really yeah. well. Um, and sometimes, as you said, disruption is now also imposed um, on advertisers with COVID-19. So um, there is no choice. Uh, you know, this is something that we're all going to be dealing with in the next few months and year. Um, and is going to be requiring a whole new shift in the way we approach uh, content creation, advertising, and any other um, industry and world out there. So great to have that final piece. Um, what is your advice for the next, now that we're wrapping up as well, for the next kind of set of advertisers out there who might be watching um, and you know the, the kind of next months and years um, in terms of what they might bring for the industry uh, and what we'll be seeing? Yes, well, definitely with the ideas, again, um, you know, try to disrupt, try to think of unexpected fusions. I do think the future is going to be an unexpected and exotic mix of cultures and fusions. And I think that that is the way the world should be moving forward, uh, crossing boundaries, co-productions, like, you know, um, just this more integrated world, you know, fusion, fusing genres, you know, so um, definitely look and, and play and have fun and, and widen that, that range of storytelling and who you work with, um, you know, and to, in terms of the, from the directing side, 
definitely always challenge yourself to elevate the idea beyond what is um, what's what you're given in the script, you know, and and strive for that coveted black pencil level of work where it's groundbreaking. I love your advice today and it's such a great way to wrap it up. Um, so thank you so much yeah, for your time. I know we went on for a full hour at a very early time for you. <laughs> so I really appreciate your energy um, and that you were able to join us as well. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you as well, Emma. This was lovely and it was an honor to just chat with you to represent DNA D and Jamaica and to be here with Adobe. This has just been a wonderful experience worth waking up at 3.30 a.m. <laughs> great, great. <to> you. <laughs> You'll be able to go back to sleep after this, so hopefully just get another tea right and, and get on with your day. <laughs> and thanks everyone who tuned in early or not. Um, we were here, you know, every Thursday uh, with DNA D presenting a new category and today was direction. So I hope you can catch up on all the work and uh, what we've been doing as part of this partnership between Adobe and DNA D. We'll come back with monthly sessions still so stay tuned for that with next week being our first one um, but we'll see you all again very soon thanks Kia again and have a great day everyone bye everyone bye. <laughs>